So here's my little way of summarizing everything I think about with this, these weighty questions. I have this image of, um, of a scientist who is in the laboratory and he's investigating um, the structure of brains. And, and then he's, and then the, the specimen he is focused on is that of a fish. And, and then he is, so he's, he's checking out the, the, um, the structure and the dynamism of the brain. And this moment comes, this moment comes when he realizes just like, wow, it's so complex. It's so, it's amazing. Now he's talking about a, a, the fish brain and he's overwhelmed with a sense of um, just happiness that he is, that he is, has lived this life that enables him to, to have this deep understanding. And then, he's, and then he thinks about all that was required is he thinks of his professors and the years of training that it took. And then, then he thinks of his parents and they, they, they helped him go through college. And, and then, and then what, no, he had grandparents. And then he goes back further and he, he starts to express gratitude for himself for his own brain. Like, wow, how wonderful to have this kind of brain. And then he takes the next step and he realizes that the fish he's studying was the ancestor that gave birth to his brain. So all of the mammalian brains uh, really come out of the creativity of, of fish brains. Fish brains are far more diverse than mammalian brains. So there's this moment when he realizes he is examining one of his own ancestors that enabled him to have this power. So you see, that is a different kind of scientific knowledge. That is, in, in a real sense, that's knowledge of oneself. You know, just, just to call, to have a, a phrase for it, each of us, each of us is a, is a cosmological construction that took 14 billion years. So, so I, that with that starting point, you see, with that starting point, um, we we realize that when 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 we are speculating, I'm going back to your your point, like when you and your friends and anyone is is speculating on the nature of the universe, that is in a very literal sense, the universe reflecting upon itself, and so. That to me is the excitement, is 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 that 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 we are we're, we are we are waking up to the fact that our knowledge is 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 self knowledge. It's it's the knowledge of a cosmological being, which is who we are. So I guess when you ask me the question, what's the what about the ontological difference between ourselves and the universe? You see, I, there is none, not really. We are we are a further development of the universe, the scientific uh, understanding, the mathematical equations enable a new experience of reality. It, and it's that, that, ex, that ex experience of reality that has become my, um, you know, my main focus, my main interest. I mean, there's just think of all the different ways we have to experience reality. I'm, I'm just suggesting that, that, um, that the, the equations themselves enable an experience that, that hasn't been appreciated or even it happened in the history of humanity. So as I'm making this gigantic claim, and I, I, I don't want to pretend like I, I um, have, have control over all the meaning that I'm, I'm touching on. I don't. I feel like I, we're just beginning to step into this. And I... I, I gave the example of, of the ichthyologist working on a, a, a fish brain, and that would be an example of what I mean. I mean that that, that scientific understanding that, that comes from our discovery of evolution, that scientific understanding enables a relationship, an experience that um, is unlike uh, previous experiences of the depths of things. There are these these moments when the the human you know populations would would they move into experiences that were new. So I can easily it's easy for me to imagine. I, and there seems commonplace to think that that um, 
the there they are, you know, in Africa and there, and and none of them, none of them are having experiences of of a field of intelligence filling the whole universe. And then they were. In other words, there was a discovery made. There, there was, and then, uh, you know, maybe, um, and then it's all written down and celebrated in the axial age. But so now I, we developed ways of, of, of bringing forth such um, these amazing qualities that we now call divine, right? Like you say, love and uh, compassion and so forth. Uh, so I tend to I, I tend to think that those are those are great discoveries. I and I wonder. I I, I mean I I know that I would be really happy myself in in one of these um, uh, metaphysical formulations because right away as you start talking I just I just feel my spirit lift and become lighter, but I'm. Um, I'm also thinking, possibly that that uh, this new this new breakthrough that that we you know we call the evolutionary cosmology, I, I think it it's going to develop um, its own processes for evoking um, experiences that that may be very similar to to uh, what's in Vedanta and other other systems. They, Maybe even identical. I don't know. Paul Dirac, Nobel Prize in Physics. I mean, he's a genius, no question about it. And he stumbled on this insight into order via the mathematics and ends up with a with an, a view of the universe that celebrates our existence as something that was that was built into the universe from the very, very beginning. I mean, it, I mean it. It, it 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 just it changes me when spending these years thinking about it, but it's it's open ended. It's still happening. But I'm glad you you picked up on Dirac. I was so amazed by him. The noosphere <clears throat> is uh, the simplest definition is the noosphere is the is a, a united humanity. That that'd be the simplest way. Um, the next level would be <clears throat> the noosphere is is a um, is the next the next stage of Earth's evolution. Uh, so uh, we we know the Earth. I mean, scientifically, we know the Earth began four and a half billion years ago as molten rock. So, and then the oceans came forth. And so we we can call that the the geosphere. And then um, life emerged in, in various complex ways and then spread out over the whole um, planet and then altered the atmosphere, for instance. And we call that the biosphere. And then human humanity emerged and with, a, with uh, coming out of the geosphere, coming out of the biosphere, but with, with the power that the... Um, the other living beings did not have. And it, this new power enabled it to actually uh, spread out over the planet and become as, as powerful as the geosphere or the biosphere. I mean, by say, by this, I mean, in the simplest sense that humanity now is, is alters the atmosphere each year more than all of life considered together. I mean, that's in other words, we we we've matched the, the power of the biosphere. And but but here's it even goes further. This is this is gonna be hard to believe, but we humanity now moves more of the material of earth than than the winds and the tides. And the volcanoes, all, all together, humanity moves the earth more. I'm trying to say how to think about the noosphere. The noosphere is this connected up humanity that has even changed the dynamics of biological evolution.
we've we've altered things even at that level we are becoming a, a thinking planet uh, and but we're not aware of it so we we're bringing to our activities the consciousness of just another mammalian species you know you know survive and multiply but we haven't yet we haven't yet fully grasped who we are and now I go back just to refer, we, we are the universe reflecting upon and activating itself in conscious self-awareness. So this, this would be it's a, a new understanding. The noosphere is a new understanding of, of why we are here, what we are about. It's at that level. It's one of these, these colossal ideas that, that Teilhard de Chardin um, arrived at in mid-20th century. We're the only species that we've come upon that has uh, a symbolic language that can be uh, expressed in forms that endure through time. So, so with that one move, with that one move to learn how to capture our experiences in a way that our descendants can appreciate and hold on to, that with that one move, we we changed ourselves from um, individuals into a, a large community. Ask yourself, where is the English language? Where where did, where does it reside? Well, it's not in dictionaries. It's it's in each of us, but it's not it's not contained in any one of us. The English language or the human language is held by humanity, and it. It is this, this way in which we can connect with each other and, and we can learn from each other. Every time we speak or do anything, we're drawing upon knowledge that goes back to the beginning, really, of, um, of humanity. So that is, that, that's why we, we are evolving a million times faster than any other species. It's, it's another way in which the universe has transcended itself. Biological evolution has transcended itself with cultural evolution. To digest your lunch, you know, there, there are patterns of that process that were actually invented three billion years ago. The science offers this a, a new way of thinking about the whole first. We didn't know about the reality of extinction and really until the 19th century. They the, when when philosophers would uh, reflect on it, on the idea of well, you know, extinction, they um, they they would they would more often than not come to the conclusion it's impossible. Now, this I find this so stunning. One of the reasons uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson was was in favor of the Louisiana Purchase is because he was hoping that we would find. Um, the dinosaurs there. There was awareness of these gigantic bones, all right? And, and a, a mind as superior as Thomas Jefferson, he was one of the most intelligent people of the time. He thought the dinosaurs lived over there. You see, so we, we, the, the whole thing of, of, of the evolutionary time had not really, here's another one. I mean, Thomas Jefferson is one thing. Ralph Waldo Emerson, who is probably the, the, the greatest um, cosmologist America produced before uh, mathematical cosmology, he was convinced that it was impossible for a species to go extinct. And then while, while these philosophers are, are convinced it's impossible, we were destroying already species. So even I don't want to call that a psychotic mind, but it's, it's a mind that is, is so ignorant of what is taking place. And I'm talking about my mind. I mean, I, I think we are so profoundly ignorant of, of the deeper dimension of what's taking place. I mean, you know, we, we don't, in other words, we don't have the intellectual categories to take in um, reality in its fullest. And, and maybe we won't for a million years. I mean, in other words, this is the whole thing that I find thrilling about the, the way in which humanity is developing and, and deepening our understanding. The noosphere is, is emerging, but it is, it is, all, it is also uh, 
in in its act it's acting it's acting to draw forth um, a behavior and and forms of consciousness that will enable it to emerge further when like just to give a, a physical example where we are today in this moment uh, is is being uh, in part orchestrated by that our own deepest fascinations. So the way in which we are, what we find ourselves fascinated by um, is the is the noosphere uh, drawing us into activity that will make its embodiment uh, clear. Each of us is, is, is just this person that lives in a certain place and has relationships and so forth. And, and we are the manifestation of something vast. And the language here would be different, but um, I've already said it a number of times. So we're individual people going about our day. And we are a cosmological construction that required 14 billion years simultaneously, same time. So that it, it, it's the question of what is the primary um, aim of Earth? And, and uh, how, how does that relate to our, our daily lives? So here's, I think... So far, this is this is the best example I have of of conveying um, what what the noosphere is. The best example I have, and that is the James Webb Space Telescope. I started off saying, imagine ourselves back three hundred thousand years. So just imagine ourselves back then, and I, I'll bet you anything. People were looking at the stars and going, I mean, "What's going on?" You know, like, and they and they they would think about it and because they're so compelling, you know, for humans. Um, and that, that interest in the stars continues for all 300,000 years. So already, but my point I want to say, first point is this, that would be an example of a, of a primary human urge. The primary human urge is to, is to understand what's the nature of where we are. But a couple, a couple of interesting facts about the James Webb Space Telescope. It, it was constructed by engineers in 14 different countries. And they, you know, they put together all their skill and knowledge and um, built the James Webb Telescope. So each of them is essential, but, but not one of them alone can do it. Now, but, uh, but think of this, hold it. Each of those engineers had to learn from their teachers, you know, grade school, high school, college. And those teachers were passing on knowledge that had been um, formulated millennia in the past. So they, they're, they're essential for the building of the James Webb Space Telescope. So were the farmers to feed them. So were the, the political figures that kept society ordered enough so that this human development could take place. And so if you, just in the most obvious way, a billion humans, you know, back through time and, and present today, could look at the James Webb Space Telescope and say, we built it. You know, it, it, was, it was all of us, with each one being essential. So that, that's an example of the, of, the, of the noosphere in action. It is, it is a comp. The, the James Webb Space Telescope is a hundred times more sensitive than the Hubble. I mean, we there's no question, but we will learn things about the birth of the universe never learned before our time. A lot of scientists are 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 very confident that we will be the generation that identifies living planets. There's something like 50 billion planets in the Milky Way galaxy. Around 300 million of them are Earth-like. So those are going to be examined carefully, and we will be able to establish if they're living or not. In other words, my, my point is, is that just think of this knowledge. Think of what we've learned compared to what we knew at 300,000 years ago when we were just kind of like amazed by the stars. So this, th this is the noosphere in action, and it was... It was satisfying a deep urge in humanity, the urge to know the nature 
of the universe, the nature of where we are. But here's my last point. There, there are other primordial urges. I don't know how exactly to, to name them, but there's the urge to educate. There's the urge to, to heal. There's the urge to, to, to build uh, structures that, that, that protect us. All these, and, and there's the urge to forgive. We have a deep desire to, to forgive and make amends. So, so if, we, if we think of these, these primordial human desires and, and they, are, they are being fulfilled by the noosphere, by the human collective, we get a sense of what it means to be human. We get a new sense of what it means to be human. And what's so great to, is, is, to, is to reflect on the fact that what, what we will bring forth even goes beyond our ability to understand now. It's just, it, it, it gives a thrill for being alive. See, that's, that's why I so want to, you know, get to the, the you know, people that are depressed by our situation. Great things are happening. Just imagine having a little beaker, you know, and you have chemicals in it. And they're, they're, it's all, it's a, it's a placid uh, liquid. You're just looking at it, nothing's happening. And then all of a sudden, it starts to spiral out, you know, like, like a, a, a little spiral emotion. And sort of like, you know, where did that come from, right? I mean, it's almost like some creatures were there. And then it stops. And, you, and then it's all over all over. Then it starts again, and it starts spiraling out. And this is referred to as, as, a, as a chemical clock. But it just now try to imagine that we're talking about many, many trillions of trillions and trillions of molecules. Who is, who's there organizing all of them? You take a cloud of matter, and you, you put it together, and all of a sudden it starts to move. And then it creates a star. And the stars create the carbon, the phosphorus, the nitrogen. The whole thing, all right, is, is being orchestrated by the matter itself. Somehow or another, there's this potentiality that's ignited. We hear the word matter, and then we hear another word mind. In other words, that's something different. And, and Teilhard was driving home the point, he was trying to drive home the point that that, that matter intrinsic to itself is the potential for creative synthesis. So I have this a default position of thinking of matter as being um, inert, and yet it's uh, it's an it's an excited state. It's um, it's a flashing. It's a it's an energetic transaction. It's it's way more alive um, in our thinking now than it was during most of modern science. So. Um, you know how are we to how are how are we to feel about our our present moment where you know thousands of species are being extinguished each year and you know we're still dragged into warfare you know, how are we how are we to think about that we need to begin with the universe itself in in our thinking we need to establish ourselves in the universe and and then do our thinking as opposed to um, uh, establishing ourselves in, in the economics of America or the, or the politics of Europe or it's begin with something larger. The only way we're going to escape um, the, the, the warfare and this type of, of existence, the only way is to develop into, into beings who see the whole first. Who are we? I <laughs> mean, who are we? I mean, and, and, and it's, it, I think it is, um, it's a fresh way of asking the question because now it's within an evolutionary context. But think of the atoms of your body and each one of them and then recognizing each one of them comes from the star. And now um, go back in time um, before the birth of the earth and sun, before the birth, and, and, and imagine the cloud, imagine the cloud of uh, stretched out over thousands of light years. And now just, just if you, every, every atom that presently comprises who you are, 
presently. Somehow, you see, all of those atoms were brought together through this long evolutionary process to become you. And that the, the very fact that that happened is, is stupendous. The complexity of it blows our minds. Now, just imagine if, if that challenge had been your challenge. What if you were responsible for getting all those atoms together? It brings about a lightness of being it, because we're, we're inside of, of forces and powers that are so far beyond us, but, but here we are. The first benefit of, of, of spiritual development is the strength to endure the chaos of our time. And that's, that's always uh, meant a lot to me. Um, uh, one more uh, quote, and this, is, this was my, one of my all-time favorites, and it relates exactly to your question. <clears throat> it, it's, it's actually uh, from Alfred um, Krober, an anthropologist at UC Berkeley. Uh, he's the one that found um, and worked with um, Ishi, the last the wild Indian. Anyway, what he said was, um, the ideal state for the human is not exactly bovine placidity. It is rather the highest degree of tension that can be creatively born. And that, that's always meant so much to me that, and, and because we, we do have, we do have in America, at least, um, a, there's a strain of, um, of, of wanting bovine placidity. It, it's, it has to do with the drive um, for <clears throat> material wealth, material money, and as a way of, of, of being done with all of that, the, you know, the tension and hardship of life, and then just securing yourself inside of a palace and, and then watching media. And, you know, it's a, it's, it's, it's a kind of bovine placidity. But, but what, what, um, what we need, what we need is, uh, you know, creative leadership uh, in the midst of this. And just, just to be able to, this is, this is the noosphere in action. It's delivering to us the, the extreme states of suffering all around the planet. And the, I, in no way will I say that the, these are somehow um, a good thing. I want that understood very clearly that this is, uh, it's absolutely horrific. However, because it is taking place, it it does it can serve you and now just speaking to anyone who is disturbed because the the transformation that, that that Rick and I have been talking about throughout our our conversation is is a deep change a deep change of heart a deep change of mind it's 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 coming to a, a fundamentally new um, insight into what it means to be human and it's hard to change one's fundamental orientation in the universe. It's extremely difficult, but, but the, the suffering that's taking place on the planet can be beneficial if it has, if you allow it to break down those structures of, of your existence that are actually participating in the violence. It, it does have that power. But suddenly you realize you can see through all the false uh, lurements of, of contemporary society and see into what is essential. You can awaken to the whole that's, and, what, and what your role might be in the midst of it. That, so that's, that's basically how I, I respond to the difficulty. I, I try to hold it in my heart and, and, and wonder in what way can I um, be part of the solution. Reflections like that help me uh, escape of uh, becoming depressed by the daily news. <music> <music>